Good morning. I'm going to start off talking about our humanitarian you. One of the things I love about our simulation hospital is that I always say we were built at the School of Nursing, but we're not just for the School of Nursing at Cal Cities. Our goal is to be able to educate providers locally, nationally, internationally, and provide patient safety, whether they're in patient outcomes, whether they're in an acute care setting, an outpatient setting, or as part of the humanitarian relief. When we look at humanitarian relief, we know that we show up. Even if we can't get there, we'll hitch a ride somewhere. We'll find a way to respond. <clears throat> and what's it, whether we're in Japan because of the tsunami, whether we are in the Bahamas because of the hurricane, as healthcare providers, we want to go. And maybe we watch the news and think, it's not really that bad. Or maybe we think we're going to find that one place that has running water, electricity, air conditioning, bug spray. That's where we're going to camp out, and that's where we're going to help. And then we get there and we realize it's much, much worse than we have ever imagined. We don't have what we need. We haven't brought food, we haven't brought water, we haven't brought the appropriate paperwork. And now we show up to help. And instead, the people that were there to help end up needing to help us because we were woefully unprepared. Wanting to respond isn't enough. We need a specific skill set. We need to be able to have competencies that are met. We need to be able to have training and education. So with that in mind, <coughs> faculty and staff, from the School of Nursing and Health Studies, from the Gordon Center, from the UM School, Miller School of Medicine, from UL Health, we all came together and worked with Humanitarian U to develop this simulation exercise for our nurses, physicians, nursing students, grad students, and residents. The goal being giving them that experience here to better prepare them if they ever work it was a year in the making. It took us a long time to get the logistics. We were also the first group that had asked a um, humanitarian youth to put on this course on a campus. Normally, they're in a park, they're at a, a campsite. We were actually having them do it here. And our second requirement was we wanted this to be a train to train course. We wanted to end up with the skills we needed to be able to continue offering this annually. These are the members of the humanitarian youth. We have one of our faculty who actually took the course, but was not going to the picture anyway. We had over 30 participants. They were divided into teams of five, of five teams, and each team represented a non-governmental organization. Each team was made up of five to six students or participants. They had to decide amongst themselves who was going to be the leader, who was going to be in charge of communications, who was going to be in charge of their campsite, security, their supplies. Prior to even coming to the exercise, they were required to do online modules. They had some face-to-face -face interaction. They were given, without giving too much away, a list of supplies that they were required to bring. They were also given a list of instructions of what they couldn't have with them. All of this was done based on a competency framework that looked at their abilities or the competencies, competencies were, that we were going to measure was being safe and secure at all times, leadership during a humanitarian effort, actually being able to deliver a product, and 
And when we looked at how to play this out, this auditorium became the airport. They had to go down the stairs where they were welcomed by some Landian officials and they had to go through customs. As they were going through customs, some Landian officials asked them to pay for coming into the country. Their bags were opened. Things that they thought they could sneak in that were on the do not bring list were removed, including cell phones. They lost a lot of their snacks because for the next three days, all they were going to eat were meal re MREs, meal replacements, and they had to keep track of them. They went through customs. That was their first station. They were now headed to their campsite, and they thought all was right with the world. Drivers had been assigned to drive them to their campsite. Lo and behold, they were hijacked because Simlandia had some civil unrest and the rebels wanted to know why they were there. This was probably one of the most intense stations that we had. We actually had a couple of students need mental health services because they, it was so emotional they broke down and we had one student leave because it dredged up so much stuff she just couldn't continue. We had the facilitators have told us this can happen, it's okay. We would rather have it happen here in a very controlled environment than if she had actually deployed and had this happen where she can get it. They were going to spend the next three days living outside. They had to build their tents. Most of them had never built a tent. And in typical Miami fashion, the weather helped us. <laughs> it started to rain. So they were building tents while it was raining. Our siren went off, letting us know that lightning was coming, so we had to get them out from under the trees. Tents were half built, tents were built incorrectly. Tents got watered down, tents couldn't be used. They had forgotten to secure their MREs that they had already been given. So the villagers from Sinlandia, Sinlandia took advantage, stole their food. That was awesome. One of the other things that they needed to do during these three days was actually go to some hospital, which had taken a huge hit with the earthquake and the tsunami. They had to assess the condition of the hospital. Was it functioning? What parts were functioning? How many patients were already there? How they could help? And through it all, you had villagers and rebels constantly moving around, trying to take stuff, create chaos. This is a little view of what it was like. He's working on <laughs> This is a food distribution center. I'm going to go back and give them a minute. So some of the other stations we had was a food distribution center. They had to find a place that was secure enough to hand out food 
and not have it overrun by villagers who were hungry, who were tired, who hadn't seen food, and really, really just wanted to eat. So they tried to create this environment where they set up the tables, they set up the food. The villagers looked for weaknesses. They were the volunteers and came in. And oh, just basically just cook over, stole all the food. They did get to do it again. And the second time went a little, a little better. So we had a media person and the media person followed them around for three days and created two videos. This video is actually the international video showing that the humanitarian relief effort was there. They all had good intentions. The second video actually takes the same footage and shows it from the rebel side and basically talks about how we came in and took over, took all of their stuff, took care of ourselves, and then left. At night, because they slept here in the tents, the villagers came to the campsite and they were trying to get the relief workers to come out, give them food, give them shelter. This is them arriving and trying to get into the country. And this is the general who is asking for that fee for taking stuff out of their bags. And these are the relief workers saying, we're here to help, we're boots on the ground, things are going well. One of the exercises where they were hijacked. And each car was hijacked. And they were made to kneel on the ground and had the rebel forces around them, asking them what they were here for and who they were working with. It was a three-day exercise. Day one was 24 hours after the tsunami. Day two was a week after the tsunami. Day three was two weeks after the tsunami. So they all had tasks that they needed to complete, including population counts, um, looking for outbreaks. She was one of the villagers that was very upset because they had all the food and they weren't sharing. And as you can see, you had one of them walking away with some MRAs. And they were all walking around. It was really funny because a lot of them had never built a tent and they didn't realize they needed, they could ask for help from other team members. They just stayed within their teams trying to build their tents. And here they are trying to build tents for some of the displaced villagers and using some of the supplies that they had. This is the second food station. And the day two, they try it again. As you can see, it's a much more organized station now. And then this is the hospital, where they're coming in to do the hospital assessment. And there are patients everywhere. The little boy was actually uh, the son of the facilitator from Humanitarian U, and he was probably the best actor we had. <laughs> he played a little rebel kid who went around stealing everything from everybody. Then in the hospital, he went around talking, being short of breath and falling on the ground and just being a huge nuisance. Day three, we got them up at five o'clock in the morning, letting them know that the, the camp had been overrun by rebels and it was no longer safe to stay there. And they had to run, take their stuff and run and abandon the campsite. By this time, we had pretty much kept them up all 55 hours. They were wet because it rained all three days. They were hungry because MREs aren't as delicious as people think they are. <laughs> we ended the scenario and they actually we had a, an opportunity to debrief them, provide them with a hot meal, 
and talk to them about lessons learned. The 30 plus students had all initially wanted to do this, were looking forward to being deployed. After the exercise, about 20 maintained their desire to be deployed. Another 10, five for sure said they were never going to do this. But this kept giving up a lot of students. We had five that were, well, it depends on where I'm going to be deployed to. And then the other 10 were set to go, yeah, we're going to do this, not a problem. What we found was this was shortly after this, Hurricane Dorian hit. And an email went out, and a lot of the participants that had gone through this had a better understanding. And those 10 that were gone home, those were the 10 that we were getting emails going, where are we go from here? What are we doing? Our goal is to actually run this annually. Unfortunately, Dr. Tony, who spearheaded um, them coming to us, has left and is in New York. We also have a new um, curriculum for our uh, med school, so we're looking at where we can fit it to still give the student, the participants a great, a great experience, but our goal is to continue this annually. Any questions? I'm sorry we didn't have sound. It's a full cool meeting. They were fuzzy. They were 
we've met every every evening. They had an ultra meeting where they had to present what was going on, how many people, how many patients they had seen, any epidemics that they were watching. And there were students who sat at that table and could not form a sentence because they were so tired. And it was the stress that we put them under of what's going to happen to men? What's next? Where are the rebels coming from? So one of the things that they all commented on was just a part of this. Did you find that after this um, session, how, were, how was their mental health? We had, like I mentioned, that one student who didn't finish, a couple of them sought out our mental health professional for a one-to-one -one personal debrief, de-escalation. And a lot of them recognized they were emotional because they were tired and sleep deprived and hungry. We followed up with all of them and made sure that everybody was up. But it was intense. And again, this was a slice. It's a distant reality. And it was simulated reality. We had porta potties that they had to use. They weren't allowed inside the building. They had to use porta potties. They had their MREs. We made it as uncomfortable as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And even, I think we could have made it even a little more uncomfortable, but again, we were on a campus, there were things that we were beyond our control. It was enough that we have students, we have participants saying, I have never, mm -hmm. ever before. And they were done cold, this is what I'm going to do, I'm so excited. And at the end of the day, I have my air conditioning, running water, electricity, good to go, I will take it. It was an interesting exercise as far as how some of them changed their minds and how some of them became even more fully committed to this. None of them are next to Yes. 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 Which is the other thing that I didn't need to talk about. We did this exercise one day, one week, two weeks. Everybody shows up for that beginning. I hate the word sexy, but oh, this is where I'm going to really make a difference, this is exciting, and we forget that it's a long-term commitment, and you're going to need people coming in months, even years later. Everybody wants to get in on that boots on the ground, first call, but this is about preparing them long-term. You may not be the boots on the ground 24 hours later, you may be coming in two months later, but like two months later, they still may not have electricity, you're still struggling with running water and clean water, and you're still going to show up and do it. Do you feel sick of this? Yes, I care. They all signed a consent, letting them know that we were not liable for any injuries, letting them know that this was going to be uncomfortable, letting them know that they were going to be filmed, they were and we were going to use the film. And all of the signs and our moments of fear, which I found pretty interesting because they had gotten, they were warned ahead of time that this was going to be a company. Are there opportunities for other schools, like other students from other schools? That is our goal. That is our goal to be able to open it up community wide. Again, it's built at the school of nursing and not just schools. We're also looking because the weather was wonderful, but it made some of the exercises difficult every time the siren went off for lightning. We had to pull them from our big open fields. We're looking at not running it in the summer and being able to run it March or in the winter where the weather is a little more cooperative. 
so that they can actually, we can run it without having to stop and get them out of harm's way. We weren't counting on the lightning. And there were lightning rods. All of the tents were under the canopy of trees. Legend in it plain. I'm going to wear my other hat now and talk about human trafficking. When we look at human trafficking, we know five the top five cities in the United States are Washington, D.C., Atlanta, <coughs> Orlando, Miami, and Las Vegas. We're sitting in the perfect spot to make a difference. Human trafficking is the fastest growing criminal industry in the world. It's $150 billion strong. The only way I think we can combat it is through education and awareness of who our human trafficking victims are. School of Nursing and Health Studies is committed to combating human trafficking. And that commitment includes creating a center to combat human trafficking, and providing lifelong learning and continuing education credits for everyone, all of our healthcare providers. Currently, the state of Florida is one of two, maybe three states, that require human trafficking education for continuing life insurance. By 2021, it will include physicians and other healthcare providers. So we're sitting, we can be at the forefront and actually make a difference. We can create those scenarios, create those experiences that will allow us to have healthcare providers and my colleagues will talk about soon to be healthcare providers, be able to recognize human trafficking victims and be able to effectively treat them and get them sent to help. Yesterday, we held our first Human Trafficking Awareness Summit, and we worked with field trafficking. If you're unfamiliar with field, field is a group of individuals, 3,100 people strong. It covers survivors and multidisciplinary professionals with the goal of ending human trafficking from that public health lens. A lot of what we talked about yesterday what revolved around not only recognition, but questions. What do we ask? How do we ask it? We can't stay silent. A lot of times we find or we suspect there's a human trafficking victim in the emergency department, and yet we don't say the right thing. We don't say anything at all. We're scared of what do we say. And we lose them. We fall through the cracks. I love this quote because it says, let it not be said that I was silent when I needed you. It's not only about not being silent, it's about knowing what to say and how to say it so that we can build the rapport and we can actually recognize and recover these victims. Using HEAL and my partner in uh, Crime in the Back from the University of Vermont, Last month, we hosted our state attorney from Miami-Dade County, Catherine fernandez Rondo, prosecutors, law enforcement um, agents, and community advocates. And we talked with all of combating human trafficking, especially the Super Bowl was coming. And we decided we would show them one of the scenarios that we have that allows us to hopefully create that continuing education piece so that all the providers can come. When we look at human trafficking, a lot of us, when we do our CEUs, 
We sit in front of a computer, we read the case study, we check the boxes, and we've learned absolutely nothing, but we've met the requirement. Human trafficking has to do more about, more than just checking the boxes. We have to get in there, The simulation is that perfect tool to create these scenarios, so that yes, you're gonna do some pre-work, you're gonna do a module, but let's come in here and actually have a case where, connect the dots, put the theory into practice, recognize the victim, learn what to say, how to say, so that you can go out and be better practitioners. It's not just check a box. So the scenario we ran revolves around Martha and her handler Julian. The nurse practitioner student was given this pre-brief where Martha ran away from home two months ago. Her home was an abusive situation. Julian found her and Julian has been using her as a victim and selling her. They had a fight. Julian pushes her down the stairs. He takes off. Witnesses find Martha. She's unconscious. They call 911. 911 uh, fire rescue comes, picks her up. She's on her way to the airport. She wakes up. She doesn't want to be there. She doesn't want to go to the emergency department, but she's going. Julian is nowhere to be seen. Police officers have already tried to interview her twice. She is not giving any information other than, yes, I had a fight. He's my boyfriend. It's no big deal. He didn't push me. I slipped. I fell down the stairs. I want to go home. Again, the nurse practitioner student knows that this is a victim of human trafficking. The objectives for her scenario were actually provide privacy, establish rapport, figure out why she's here, ask screening questions as appropriate and then discuss safety. So she's going in knowing that her patient is a victim. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Giovanna. I'm the nurse practitioner today. Can I have mm -hmm. your name? Marta. Hi, Marta. Um, how are you doing today? I'm fine. I I don't know why they call 911. I'm ready to Do go. Do you need a blanket or anything? Um, I, I yeah, know, I guess it's kind of cold in here. Any water, food? Um, sure. Do you have? Yeah. Okay. Hi, nurse. Can I get uh, a, a tray and some water for her, please? Thanks. Here you go, my dear. Oh, that's a pretty big bruise. Yeah, I must have uh, bumped into something. It's fine. All right, so as a part of taking care of you, I have a couple questions that I have to ask. Yeah, These how long am I going to be here? Um, this, I'm just assessing you right now, but we have to take care of this foot, and you were just given some strong payments, so you will be here because we have to assess you. Um, so these questions I'm going to ask are routine. I ask all my patients, and everything you tell me is confidential, okay? Mm -hmm. Can I have your name? Martha. Um, do you know the day of the week? I don't know. I have no idea. I work so much for Monday. Today's actually Wednesday. Um, how many hours are you working? I, is this going to be long? I really need to know. It's just a few more questions. Mm -hmm. um, what did you say? How many hours do you work a week? I don't know. Do you I'm have any time working. off? I'm always working. Okay. Um, are you ever denied food or water, medical care, or anything like that? I mean, I have to stay, you know, in shape, so I'm sometimes I go a little bit hungry, but that's part of the job. That's fine. Is everything okay? Mm -hmm. I, you look I have to go. I really need to leave. I, I'm fine. I have no pain. I'm, I'm okay. Well, I, I see a, a lot of bruises, different stages of healing. Um, is everything okay? Is anyone hurting you? Um, I mean, I must have bumped into something. I don't even know. It's fine though. I'm okay. Is there anyone I could contact? Your family? No, my family's. I, I gotta get this. It's okay. 
I don't know, I must have passed out. I woke up and I was in the hospital. I, I, I don't know what happened. No, no, I didn't say anything to the police. I'm trying to get out of here. This lady's asking me questions that you won't let me need. I'm sorry. I know, I'm trying. They won't let me leave. I, I don't know how to get out of here. I'm trying to get out of here. I don't know what to do. I, I gotta go. You need me to sign something? or I, I really need to get out of here. I realized you are very worried and very shaken up right now. I cannot let you leave. We have to take a look at your leg. It's very, it looks very bad. And I know it's hurting you. Um, but one thing I do want to tell you is there's a human trafficking hotline. It's 233-733. It's called Be Free. Um, they're always available as well as orders are always open. And if you do not feel safe at any time, please contact them and they are always available for you as well as us. And if there's anything we could do for you here, we will do it. But I cannot let you do right now. Simulation complete. Thank you very much, Dr. Barroso, for that. Um, our next presenters are Dr. Deborah Salami, Director of the Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing and uh, Associate Professor of Clinical at the School of Nursing and Health Studies, and Dr. Beatrice Valdez, Assistant Professor of Clinical. A pediatric nurse for over 25 years, Dr. Salami previously led the Emergency Department Pediatric Intensive Care Unit and Hemodialysis Unit at Miami Children's Hospital. She's board certified nationally as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Dr. Valdez is a certified healthcare simulation educator who teaches simulation across the undergraduate curriculum. Her clinical specialties include all levels of medical surgical nursing, critical care nursing, and health assessment. They are going to talk to you about a very innovative um, project, two innovative projects that they took on in the in the context of the undergraduate and psych mental health nursing curricula in order to make our students more aware of and able to respond to human trafficking. Dr. Salami Valdez.
Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all enjoying this nice chilly weather. I was teasing Kate from, from um, Vermont, but she's the one that brought it to us. <laughs> and she was a little disappointed that she didn't get some sunny weather. <laughs> um, so this morning, Dr. Valdez and I are gonna talk about how we um, incorporated human trafficking into both the graduate and undergraduate curriculum. I'd like to first start off, I should say Dr. Valdez and I'd like to start off to say thank you for um, all the support that we received um, from our team here and from abroad. Uh, Dr. Monroe, uh, Dr. Jonelle Potter, uh, the HEAL Simulation Subcommittee, um, the Clinical Simulation Laboratory at the University of Vermont, um, the, the School of Nursing uh, Simulation faculty, the specialists and the technicians, and also we had an accelerated undergraduate student by the name of Lindsay Lester, who um, was actively involved in this process as well, so we'd like to acknowledge her. So the objectives for um, this presentation uh, that we hope we will accomplish is that we can go over current practices in the current um, healthcare setting. We're going to describe how human trafficking scenarios were developed for the undergraduate and the graduate programs. We're going to discuss um, the training and the role of the standardized patient in human trafficking simulations. And we're going to talk about the learning objectives that we developed for the pre-brief post-brief in the scenarios in both undergraduate and graduate simulation. So in, with regards to, to healthcare settings and what's going, out, going on now currently is healthcare providers are not prepared to identify human trafficking survivors. As Dr. Barroso mentioned earlier, there's only two or three states in the United States that require healthcare providers to receive training. And I'm proud to tell you that Florida is one of them. So we were one of the pioneers in getting the process going. In addition to even having just healthcare providers be knowledgeable, I think that a lot of other disciplines should be knowledgeable as well. And I always use the example of the state of New Jersey who, re who requires hairdressers, you know, beauticians, um, to receive education about domestic violence or intimate partner violence. And I think that would be a great opportunity in addition to healthcare providers receiving some formal education when people who are getting licensed for the renewal, you know, as a manicurist or beautician, those are people that hear people's stories every day. And we just kind of take that for granted. But I think it's really important that we broaden our horizon and educate a whole host of people in addition to healthcare providers. So getting back um, to the healthcare setting, it's interesting because healthcare providers often see people who are being trafficked many times. And often, they often consider these patients to be a little bit challenging and maybe a little bit difficult at times. It's estimated that 68% of traffic survivors report that they had contact with a healthcare provider during their time of captivity. But we're just not picking up on it. We're not recognizing that. So before we actually got started in developing the scenarios, Dr. Valdez and I felt it was really important that we take a peek at the cues and competencies and make sure that we incorporate the cues and competencies into our scenarios. So the two that we incorporated were the evidence-based practice and safety. So a big part of our role as faculty members is we have the challenge of preparing future nurses who need to have not only the knowledge and the skills, but also the attitudes necessary to really perform their job when they get into clinical practice or you know as a career. And we want them not only to, to have the skills, the knowledge, and the attitude, but we want them to provide quality 
um, patient care. So it's very important to incorporate the competencies into the scenarios. So these were our really our key objectives uh, of the scenarios. We wanted the students to be able to recognize and appreciate the red flags of human trafficking when they're encountered in the clinical setting. We wanted them to have an understanding of the types and the prevalence of this global epidemic. We wanted them to um, identify usual presenting health issues that they might encounter in, in individuals that are survivors of human trafficking. What are some of the common risk factors that they might see? What are, what are some of the common symptomatology or healthcare issues they might encounter? We wanted the students to be able to demonstrate a focused health assessment on a patient who's human trafficked. We wanted them to understand and to learn how to ask some very important questions. I always teach the students that the answers you get are based on the questions you ask. If you don't ask the right questions, you're not going to derive helpful information. So we, we looked at both work-related questions and living condition questions. So some work-related questions included, what are your current working conditions like? Are you allowed to go eat and use the bathroom? Do you have to ask permission to do so? How many hours in a typical day or night do you work? Has anyone ever threatened you if you said you might quit? Can you change or leave your job if you want to? So those were some examples of work-related screening questions. Some examples of living condition screening questions could include, are the doors and windows locked? Are you able to get out if you want to get out? Where do you sleep? Where do you eat? Does someone have your personal information and won't allow you to have it, such as your license or your passport? Where do you bathe? So these are some really good questions that we wanted the students to learn to ask. We also explored, um, wanted them to explore what are the community resources that are available um, and if they were to make a recommendation, who would they recommend or refer the students to? Especially for those who might be in the transition process. And then the additional objective that we added for the, the postmaster psychiatric students was the concept of trauma-informed care. And that is by far considered the, the best treatment for individuals who are survivors of human trafficking. So with regards to equipment and supplies and props and moulage, you know, we did have moulage for the standardized patient. Our work traffic uh, SP, we applied some makeup under her eyes to make it look really dark, like she was really exhausted. Um, some red um, blush on her cheeks to give the appearance of like a heat stroke, because you'll hear the scenario in just a couple minutes. She had cracked lips, scratches up and down both of her arms, very calloused hands, and stained nails. And she had a branding tattoo of a barcode on her neck. She was able to use her cell phone. Our sex traffic SP presented with a short dress with high heels, exaggerated facial make makeup, eyeshadow mascara and a bright red lipstick and also had a branding tech too. So how do we go about training our SP? We developed a standardized patient script and in that script we had the history of the presenting illness, the medical history as well as the medication history and we also included the social environment and the home life. And before we actually launched the simulation, we did uh, an SP simulation pilot. So we were able to kind of work out the bugs before we did it in front of 20 students. And these are our, our two graduate SPs. Um, this is Lindsay Lester. Um, she 
was one of our accelerated students. She was really involved because she had a master's degree in psychology and she had a lot of expertise in trauma-informed care. So when she found out that Dr. Valdez and I were involved in this, she volunteered to participate. And she actually wrote this section on, on trauma-informed care. So this is, I just want to acknowledge her. She's from California and she moved back to California. So the great student. And then for the undergraduate SPs, I'd like to thank uh, Jackie Lopez Vargas and Michelle Oso, who helped us in, in doing the simulations. They are our simulation nurse specialists and they did a phenomenal job. So special thanks to both Jacqueline and to Michelle. And the whole team. And the whole team, actually. Thank you, the whole team. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the next half and Dr. Salani might chime in with the trauma-informed care because that's her expertise. So before they even did pre-briefing for the undergrad group, we had a voiceover PowerPoint, which educated them about human trafficking, you know, all the signs, the prevalence, you know, the things to look out for. And the students in undergrad curriculum were given this before their simulation day. The graduate students did not receive this training. However, they were the seniors, I believe, right? So they had been receiving training throughout to know how to communicate with people and do a focused mental health assessment. So on the day of simulation, we did a pre-briefing. We always welcome everybody to our SIM hospital. And we always talk about our basic assumption at the SIM hospital, which, which we take from Harvard uh, Center for uh, Medical Simulation, where is, we believe that everybody there that is participating at the School of Nursing Simulation Hospital is intelligent, mm -hmm. capable, and cares about doing their best and wants to improve. We also discuss the use of a standardized patient because most of the time our simulations are with mannequins. We don't want our, our standardized patient to be touched inappropriately or hurt or do anything invasive that, you know, that they're used to doing in SIM. We also oriented the grad students to the environment. The undergrad students are ready. This is their third semester, so they knew the, the simulation area. Which one is this one? Okay. So the scenario for our uh, psych mental health uh, nurse practitioners included both a work trafficked um, individual and also a sex trafficked individual. In the undergrad curriculum, we only did a work trafficked uh, individual because uh, since we're using our own simulation nurses, it felt a little uncomfortable. So we just decided to stay with the work traffic. But for the sex trafficked uh, scenario, we had Lindsay actually uh, play the role of 23 year old female in the emergency room who was medically cleared after coming in with abdominal pain and vaginal discharge. She was diagnosed and cleared and sent home on antibiotics and diagnosed with pelvic inflammatory disease, which is one of the uh, presenting symptoms that usually occurs with sex traffic individuals. The psych NP was called upon discharge to evaluate this patient before she went home. And she was to do a five minute focused assessment on mental health and develop an, uh, a treatment plan for the potential diagnosis in three minutes. So this is one of our psych and P students with Lindsay. Um, they engage, we, we let the scenario go for about 20 minutes, I believe. And this is another psych and P student doing the sex traffic. And I, the reason I'm showing you these pictures is that, the, you know, Lindsay says that she wears this kind of clothing on the weekend, okay, to go out clubbing. She is about 23, so I am trying to keep in standard with the standardized patient, make sure that she's not playing somebody who's older or somebody who's younger, so it's more realistic. And this is our video. No, if, am I supposed to do something? Oh, here, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm not the most tech savvy person. Okay. My name is Jerry. I'm a nurse practitioner student, and um, I was um, asked to come in and, and speak to you. How are you doing? Okay, I just, I, I'm feeling like 
you're worried that I'm here and I need to go back to work. Okay, and what brought you in today? Um, or I was just, you know, I just wasn't feeling right and I, 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 I fainted and I, I felt, you know, I fell or whatever. They told me and I was fine, but I, uh, it, it's like a good, it, it's Friday, so I need to go. Okay, okay. So you came in because you fainted. Somebody brought you here? Well, I just, um, yeah. Somebody, some friends, were you going out? Um, uh, you, did you come from a party? No, I was working. You were working, yeah. okay. And, um, and you didn't have any, can you tell me, can you tell me what your name is? My name is Natasha. Natasha, and when were you born? Uh, 1996. Okay, and what day is it today? Today is Sunday. Today is Sunday, do you know the date? Uh, November 3rd. Okay, and you know um, what this place is right here where we're at? I'm in the emergency room. Pardon me? And in, in, okay, do you know what hospital you're in? Somewhere, somewhere in Miami. Okay, yeah. Okay, so you don't know what hospital this is. Okay, and your friends didn't bring you in? You came, uh, how did you arrive here? Um, all I remember is just staring here, so. Okay. But I, 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 I gotta make sure I make my, I have, I have like, and more people that I have to see, so I, I don't want to get in trouble, so I need to go see. Okay. Where do you need to see your people? I, I work. And what do you do for work? Well, my boyfriend, who I live with, um, for the last six months, has told me what I need to do for work, so I, I work for him because he gives me my money for my papers, and to, he gives money towards my papers, and my son, my son lives in Russia. So okay. I need to go see my, I need, I need to go to work. Okay. I, I don't know why I'm doing it here because if he wants to be here, then he wants to not be here. So I have to okay. Um, I'm going to ask you some personal questions. Right. Um, does your, does your boyfriend make you do things that you don't want to do? To him? As, as far as sexually? Um, I mean, to him, uh, no. I mean, he gives me a place to stay. I, I stay with him, so I feel like, yeah. Okay. Do you feel like he's holding you against your will? Like, did, do you feel that he is keeping you confined in an environment and you cannot escape? He, well, he tells me that if I work, I get my money. So I feel like I have to work to get my son here. Are you having sex with other people that he sets up for you is that what you're talking about can you clarify that for me and i know that this is very personal yeah. i mean that's yeah I, I have to work okay so is he he's he has no idea okay okay and do you feel do you do you feel safe do you feel like he's going to hurt you if you do not do what he says he will give me my money Okay. He won't put the money towards the papers. Okay. He must not. Okay. So. Do you have anyone else here in Miami that is a friend or family? No, because I met him. I met him six months ago. Now I live with him. So I don't know anyone. You don't know anyone else. Okay. And do you do you want to be discharged to go back to him, or would you like us to get social services in here to help you? with a safe environment, to create a safe environment. So, so the beauty about this exercise was they were trained and they didn't know this was a human trafficking uh, patient. So uh, I think that speaks uh, volumes to the psych MP. It, they were able to ask her questions and she actually figured out that she was being sex trafficked. Uh, where other students were always available or able to do that. But anyhow, that's um, okay. So now, okay. So the second um, scenario that we did was a work traffic scenario. And again, these students had no idea what they were walking into. They were just told that this patient had a, another, you know, the same student played the standardized patient and she now was being work trafficked. 
and they were asked to go evaluate her. And after she had a fainting spell at the laundromat, and she was awake, alert, and oriented. She was being discharged, but they asked for a psych NP consult, and they were to do a five-minute health assessment and evaluate this, the patient and come up with a treatment plan in three minutes. So this is different um, pictures of the different people, and this is actually the scenario. And again, they didn't know that these were traffic individuals. Did you like drink anything or like? No, I'm just I'm just really thirsty. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'm just I have to I have to meet my quota. I have to go. I have to go back to work. Okay, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Okay. So before that, what you was doing for a living? My friend found me. My friend found me, and she introduced me to this guy, and now I live with him. Oh, was that guy? Is that your boyfriend? Yeah, that's my boyfriend. He's gonna help me with my my, my papers. Uh, your paper? Mm -hmm. What kind of paper? To be to be a citizen. Oh. Okay. So I have to go to work so I can make sure I make money for make money so I can get my papers for okay. my for my son. Okay. My son is in Russia. In Russia? Okay. Okay. How old is your son? He's four. Okay. So I want I have to go to I have to just keep working. Even though that's how I can see my son. I understand. But we you have to take care of yourself first so you're able to work and you provide like support for your son. Okay? So we have to know what's going on, what happened to you, that's why you're fainting. Is you drink anything like somebody was like around you and give you anything? No, I, I, I just all I know is that I'm thirsty. Okay. And I haven't eaten. So I need to eat and I need to go to work. Okay, since when you been eat? Like a day and a half. A day and a half? Yes. Oh, is that the, any reason for that? Well, because if I don't meet my quota, I, they don't give me food. Who give you food? The, the place you At the work? laundromat. Okay, so well, I understand. Um, so how long have you been here in the uh, United States? Like six months. Six months. Is that your boyfriend abusive by any like way? Like, well, he takes care of me, and I have a place to stay. So he's a um, like he works in the laundry mat. Well, I have to give him what I make from the laundry mat. Oh, you give him the whole amount of yeah, yeah because he's helping me get my kid here. Okay. Um, we have like places after you finish here and you are like for counseling to support you if like you would like to um to get your paper but i think he's taking the whole amount of money you're doing this is not right well i have no choice okay how you like you're making sure he's like doing your paper for you well he tells me I just have to, I have to go. I, I need to like, I need to go to work. I understand. We're going to finish here and we're checking your lab to make sure you're not going to faint again so you're able to work, okay? So um, let's finish the, like, like the assessment I'm doing with you and then um, and, uh, I will check your lab and you. So you see, sometimes I wanted to show this or you wanted to show this so you could see how awkward it is sometimes to try to get information out of people. That's very sensitive. So um, we went ahead afterwards and we debriefed. Okay, wait, I gotta do this again. Okay, there. And we used the advocacy inquir inquiry method of debrief, which is basically we asked a group, and because since uh, in the psych NP, they went in one at a time. In undergrad, they go in three at a time because they're learning and they need more um, like reassurance and it's better when they go in together, they don't feel so um, targeted as one person being evaluated. That way it's a group setting and it's not so uncomfortable for the undergrad. But the grads, they go in one at a time because they're already, um, this is a postmasters that have already been practicing. So they go in one at a time. But we asked the group, you know, how, how was that learning performance? How did they feel? 
And after they, uh, they answer how they felt about it, uh, we asked them if they could identify any kind of performance gap. And depending on what they say about that performance gap, it kind of leads the discussion for the debrief. So we ask about uh, what was their thought process with that performance gap. And that kind of, that's how we start talking about all the, our debriefing points. Depending on what that uh, performance gap was, we, we decide what we're gonna talk about, whether it's the prevalence, whether it's the presenting symptoms, whether it's the red flags, whether, yeah, the different things that, that they, we need to clarify or address. If the group doesn't figure out that something's wrong or that they didn't um, figure out the diagnosis, like we did have an instance at the beginning, um, one of the students, they didn't figure out that it was a human trafficking scenario. We went ahead and we directed the, the debrief. And those are the ways that we debriefed them to help them. And... I keep doing this by mistake. I'm used to a clicker. No, it's okay. So basically we discussed, these are the different things that we may have come up with depending on what happened with the learning group. We talked about the prevalence of human trafficking, both worldwide and nationally. We talked about the different types of vulnerable populations uh, where they congregate, where most of the time you, you find people congregating to do these things, uh, potential red flags of what you might be looking for, presenting health and mental health illnesses that they show up for. Uh, and then uh, like Debbie discussed, the work and living condition screening questions, which we discussed with Kate Nicholson from Vermont that we need to standardize that because a lot of people use different kinds of questions. And I think that, that group, the HEAL group, is going to start working on using standardized questions for that. We also discussed different state and federal uh, resources. And we went ahead and we showed them um, uh, some samples of ideas that they could institute in their organizations going forward. I'll show you a picture in a minute about ways, you know, innovative ways of letting people let you know that they're being trafficked without their handler finding out. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. But these were the additional key components that we did for the psych NPs, which was a trauma-informed care. And Dr. Salani discussed the safety, trustworthiness, peer support, collaboration, empowerment, and cultural, historical, and gender issues when it comes to tra trauma-informed care. Because that was an, an additional debrief to the psych NP graduate courses. But um, this was an innovative way to have somebody for potential uh, human trafficking or IPV, intimate partner violence or domestic violence, that you could put this in the, in the bathrooms. When you go get a urine specimen, they could go ahead and label it red and you know something's going on with that patient. Because most of the time they do show up with a handler and we would make sure that we let them know it's not always a male handler that comes with them could also be a female handler. So this is an innovative way of them trying to put that out in their community. And then we went ahead and we showed them the resources that are out there. Along the turnpike, these are posters that are out there and they're both in Spanish and English. And we were um, discussing how we could advocate for more languages, especially in Miami. We could maybe have a Creole sign, uh, you know, the top three languages. So we try to create awareness and resources. And these are our references. Any questions? None? So they're just about finished with their education. We did this in November and they were graduating in December. So I felt like they were more tuned into this experience. We actually um, did some education afterwards and showed them a video from the Glory House, which is a really powerful movie. If you've never had a chance to watch it, it's like a five, 10 minute um, video that Glory House, you know, encourages everybody to show, with permission to show it. It's very powerful. So the students were, I think they heard about it, they understood it, but they didn't really understand the gravity of it until after 
this scenario. And then you're like, wow, I just didn't think that I would ever come into contact with them, right? Um, like in an ER setting, you know, some felt like, well, maybe if I was at a community mental health, they might buzz in there. But they were like a little taken back. And when we showed them the statistics that almost 70%, they couldn't believe that. They were really astonished. That part really got to them. And then even some of the questions that we went over, the work-related questions, the living conditions, they thought, you know, I would think those things, but I never really thought to ask them those questions. You know, especially about the passport and the license. Or something as simple as, what's your address? Right? That's things we take for granted. But when you ask these individuals what their address is, they don't know. So that's another really big red flag because I think most people know where they live, right? So um, I think those were the key things. What about the undergrads? The undergrad were very moved. As a matter of fact, that sign where I showed you that you could put in the bathroom, that was one of the undergraduate students that came to me and said, Professor, I read up on this afterwards and I found this on the internet. And they also put them in bars. I don't know if you're aware of this. When you go to bars, they have them in the bathrooms, in the stalls and clubs that they say, if you're in danger or if you're being trafficked, come up to the bartender and order this drink. And it's a key, a name of a drink and they know that you're in trouble. So uh, the students were very motivated to find me even more resources, which I thought was very uh, rewarding. And they did uh, say that we're probably, um, as, as we know, not too many people have it in the curriculum, in the undergrad. So they were very grateful that we're instituting it in our curriculum. So I got very positive feedback. We also have a, um, a little one hour presentation in the pre-emergent before students get started in the nursing program. They have to do um, one hour review of human traffic from there as well. So I think that's a really good thing too. The more the better that you can get in different ways. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs>
Introduction. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, before we start our our keynote um, address, I have two important housekeeping of notes for you. First of all, if you're a participant in our Nightingale Challenge Leadership Development Program, please, and you're physically here, please go down to room 102 immediately after this presentation and sign in downstairs. So that's room 102, it's the executive boardroom. If you're not a Nightingale participant, but you are a Florida registered nurse, you can sign in at the registration table and um, we, you can receive CEU credit for the presentation. So, uh, and so back to the symposium. Um, and to our keynote address, we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Patricia Flatley Brennan here today. Dr. Brennan directs the world's largest biomedical library, the National Library of Medicine, which is a component of the National Institutes of Health. Since assuming directorship of the National Library of Medicine in 2016, she has positioned it to be a hub of data science at the NIH and a national and international resource. She spearheaded the development of a new strategic plan that envisions the, library of, the National Library of Medicine as a platform for biomedical discovery and for data-powered health. Dr. Brennan is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, the American Academy of Medical Informatics, and the New York Academy of Medicine. She came to the NIH from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she was the Lillian L. Molman Bascom Professor at the School of Nursing and College of Engineering. At the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, an innovator for effective visualization of high dimensional data, she led the Living Environments Laboratory. Dr. Brennan has a PhD in industrial engineering and particularly of interest to me, a master's of science in nursing. Her professional accomplishments reflect her background, which unites engineering, information technology, and clinical care to improve public health and to ensure the base, best patient care experience possible. Please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Brennan. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Monroe, and thank you, dear friend John, who worked hard to get me to come down south. Um, I actually thought I was coming to warm weather. I just want you guys to know, if you think this is warm weather, I got a bridge to sell you. Um, I want to welcome the people who are listening online. I understand that this talk is going to be translated into Spanish. I uh, bring to you the, a brilliant set of speech skills that people in Philadelphia have, which means we slur, we talk fast and we mumble. So for those of you who are trying to listen online, if it gets to be a problem, I'm gonna actually take an advantage and ask you to email uh, Danette, Danette, the Dean's assistant, so she can let me know to slow down. I'm gonna work hard to slow down. It's auspicious that we're meeting today to talk about 
how virtual reality, how we virtualize living and working spaces to support patients with chronic disease. If we are facing an epidemic in our country and the world right now, like nothing we have faced. In, certainly in, in my career, we have seen SARS, we have seen HIV, but we haven't seen this kind of rapid response and the need for good information. Um, we have received information uh, for, of a coordinated effort from the federal government to make sure that the content that is presented to people is actionable and informative. But I will tell you right now, it will largely still be in text. It will largely be spoken or written. And I must say, my experience as a nurse since 1975 has taught me patients don't read. And someone who's afraid and frightened or trying to adopt a new health behavior needs a lot more than a pamphlet. So we're here today to talk about some of those issues. I'm gonna be speaking to you mostly about my role as an investigator at the National Institute for Nursing Research, rather than my role as director of the National Library of Medicine. Now my day job is being the director of the National Library of Medicine, but like all or most of our directors of the institutes and centers at NIH, we keep our hand in science because really science is why NIH exists. And so it's great to be engaged with it. It energizes us and it also helps us remember the complexities of inquiry and of discovery. My job in particular is actually quite fortunate to be well aligned because the work that I'm about as a researcher, which is improving patient self-management and my day job as the director of the National Library of Medicine actually have some bridging between them. So you may hear me slip a little bit. What I wanna do in the next 40 minutes or so is talk with you about what I, uh, what I view as the challenges in home care and how virtual reality might help with this. And I'm gonna to speak to you specifically about virtuality and what we call the AVB or the Advanced Visualization Branch at NINR and to talk then specifically about which of the challenges in home care will we be addressing. But before I begin, I wanna ask how many of you have had an experience in virtual reality, either with a head mounted device or in a cave or a couple people have already. Some people think of second life as a type of virtual reality. Any second life people here in the room? Not as many, that was quite popular meh, 10 years or so ago in nursing. So those of you who've had a VR experience, how was it? Cool, okay, how come? Why do you think it was cool? Uh, it's not, uh, it's not something that you're used to. Yep, it's unfamiliar and kind of engaging and pretty. So you must have seen some great visualization. Did you get to fly? Oh, when did you? So you had tactile simulation as well as visual simulation. This is actually a very interesting question in VR. How much of sensory stimulation is needed to create what we call presence, that is the sense that I am somewhere else. The physical engagement, the physical tools are called immersive tools. And so the immersion is the quality of the VR experience, but presence is the experience of it. You can think about yourself reading Moby Dick and being on the ship. You have a sense of presence, but you're probably sitting in your living room. You're not immersed in it. Whereas VR, we try to bring the two aligned. Um, was your experience in VR, may I ask, with a head-mounted device or in a cave? Head-mounted device. So head-mounted devices, massive goggles are actually becoming the, the, the standard of VR experiences. But there are others, which we'll, I'm going to show you a little bit about today, which are, are referred to as a cave, a room that has projection. Have you been in a cave? It gave you a headache. And how long did the headache last? For a little while. Yep. So current technology has, uh, has not completely addressed the issue of visual acuity, but I have to tell the women in the room over 50, we are the worst case for virtual reality. I don't quite know what the explanation is, but I know that my students and my trainees can go in for an hour, no problem. 10 minutes and I'm already woozy. We call it simulation sickness. It has to do a little bit with vestibular stimulation. It has a little bit to do with the lag of motion. So even the most perfect virtual reality experience is still trying to create an image 
by knowing where you are integrating that quickly and displaying a change in the image and that process actually it leads to uh, some distress, particularly in women over 50. Um, the, the, the challenge, frankly, for patient care, which I'll be talking about throughout this, this session, is how do we balance the value with the complexity, especially when you think about older people where we have issues of visual acuity, uh, issues of, of postural stability. Um, and all of these are questions to be asked and answered, not reasons to avoid VR and AR. Um, anybody else want to comment on an experience with VR? Um, anybody get scared? Yeah, I I was I, I was at um, the Duke dive, and there's a D D Duke has a uh, has a massive pit um, that their projection system comes up from under. So when you walk on the base of their cave, which they call the dive, when you walk on the base of it, you you're actually walking on a projection system as well as having screens all around you. And there's one part of their simulation where you walk on a little plank, and suddenly everything besides the 12 inches you're standing on goes black. And it's a terrifying feeling. So you can evoke a lot of emotional response, which is a good and bad value of VR. And we'll talk about that also. So well, let's go back to what's more familiar to nurses for just a few minutes. I wanna call your attention to something we call the care between the care. So take a look at this horizontal line. It depicts the life in a patient's, a year in the life of a patient who's had an, a, a traumatic injury, has a fracture, goes to surgery, has recovery, gets discharge counseling, sent home with medications, hopefully not opioids, has a post-op uh, PT, and after a while is better. After a while, after the year, the person is usually better. Our, our healthcare system is not too bad, it's particularly with these kinds of problems. But I want you to take a look at the skinny little lines because that's the point where patients have contact with the care delivery system. And that is where most of the action has been for years. Most of the advances in computer technology most of our clinical interventions assume the patient is with us and frankly on our turf. But we must be able to go to where the care happens, to go to those white spaces in between, because that is where health happens. So we, are, we must be engaged with people to help them be able to participate in their own health practices, whatever they be, during those periods in between. We know a lot less about those spaces in between. We have some interject some visualization of what a hospital looks like, what a clinic looks like, where people are sitting, what they're wearing. But when we start going into that in-between space, all bets are off. It looks completely different. And this is part of our motivation for virtual reality. My work in virtual reality began about a decade ago when I realized after visiting over a thousand homes in Wisconsin that every house is different and houses are unstable and things move around. The mail was here today and there tomorrow, or there's toys on the floor, or somebody cleaned up and suddenly the place looks neat. So if you're trying to conduct systematic studies in a real house, you can't freeze it. It has to be, it, it, you have to let it grow dynamically. So I thought if we could use virtual reality techniques, we could recreate every household in the world and we could learn better how space engenders health and draws people towards health. It made us think about what we call the environments of care. And I'm gonna call your attention to five of them, although I'm gonna be paying most attention to the living environments. The living environment is the built environment where people have their dwelling. Now remember, as you all deal with it, people with migrations, you deal with individuals who are temporary livers here in Florida from their homes up north, the living environment in itself is not as stable as we believe it to be. Many people live in homes that don't have locks on doors or have multiple people coming in and out. Some people live in houses that are safe and very, very secure. Others live in houses that have physical threats. The social environment where people live is often the intimate people with whom they share their living space, but maybe family members or friends who live at a distance that are engaged in their care. The psychological environment is that environment we keep in our head, what we think of our health, our ability to self-actualize, our sense of self-efficacy. The technological environment for health has been changing pretty steadily over the last 20 years. So now iPhones are becoming one of the most important health devices in the world. Good and bad decision, frankly, but there, the technology is changing what we consider health engagement. In the health services environment, what we deliver, how it's delivered and who pays for it are all aspects of the care environments. This is a model that was advanced by Venkatish, who's a human factors engineer. And he said, if we're going to study people in context, we have to think of all these contexts. Now, we're particularly interested in the living environment. 
where are people on living on an everyday basis? And the work I'm going to be talking to you about, we'll talk about how we've been trying to use VR to both better understand the home and help people practice and rehearse skills for the home. The challenges that we see in self-management in the home are really fall into two key areas, cognitive challenges and psychomotor challenges. Cognitive challenges break down into planning, scheduling, and coordination activities. Meal planning, diet, following dietary requirements, being able to, to organize one's life to acquire and, 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 and make food accessible is, requires a great deal of cognitive or mental energy. Medication self-management, we're learning, and um, there's no surprise to people in the room, is an enormous challenge for people who are trying to self-manage, particularly now that we've begun to realize not only that not every medication is taken at 9, 1, and 5 every day, but sometimes it's only taken on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and sometimes Fridays after meals, but not on Saturday if you're going to go out for a walk. So keeping all that straight in your mind is complicated for patients. Now imagine you do this to a person who's worried, frightened, or has diminished capacity. We have very few tools except to hand them a pamphlet, and that doesn't work. We also are just at the cusp of understanding some phenomenal things about the body. The ability of your biological clock at the cellular level alters your metabolism and medication, as does the circadian rhythm of your whole organism. So now in the future, we're moving into a future where the self-administration of medications requires deep understanding of the person, of their intracellular as well as their organism level. These are going to bring additional challenges into medication management. Assessing health state and health response is probably one of the most important activities we ask of patients and we're often telling them they're not doing it right. You should have called us sooner. Why did you come in so early? What are you doing here with that? So understanding and being confident about self-management, again, is another cognitive challenge that an individual has. And coordination, you know, we think of coordination often as uh, coordinating the activities of, an in, of one person and the sequence of, act, of their health actions. But frequent, in households, coordination sometimes transcends a couple of individuals. How many people in the family have to file special diets and who has which diet? I have a sister who's a fantastic mom, has four amazing kids. Each kid has a different allergy. This one's allergic to milk and that one's allergic to wheat. And this one sometimes can take onions and sometimes can't. There's all sorts of things that have to be thought in mind. So when we talk, talk about health coordination in the home, we're often talking about team coordination, not individual coordination. We've got a long way to go to build the tools for that. The psychomotor skills that we often ask people for self-management have to do with some very practical things that often once were the purview of nurses, dressing changes, for example, now change to an individual. And I want you to think for a minute about your own homes. Where would you do a sterile dressing change in your house? Do you have a flat space? Do you have a safe and secure trash can? All these things that we're asking our patients to know about are actually quite challenging. Getting exercise and sleep rest balance is important, as well as equipment management, the increasing number of devices coming into the home. Um, any of you who've tried to find a plug in a house that's older than 1970 know that the plugs are not necessarily there. And if they're there, they don't have three prongs and you're, where are you in trouble? So we're really switching a lot of burden to patients. And as we do that, we need to enlist them as partners rather than bring them in as a different part of the workforce. I'm going to show you some pictures of houses we've been in, though, to help you think about where we actually are trying to get to. Um, we did a study for, uh, of households in central Wisconsin to look at where do people manage health information. And so we took pictures. And here's a, a wonderful place in the basement that has um, leftover kitchen equipment. That's a Nesco roaster, for those of you who don't know what it is on the left-hand side. And then all the health data is in that black folder. But there's also barbells and exercise equipment. So this is kind of the storage room and health center in this household. In this case, this lady keeps everything in her purse. Everything is in her purse. She has diabetes. She keeps her glucose monitoring in there. She keeps her glucagon in there. She keeps her medications in there. Unfortunately, she keeps her insulin in there too, which is not a good thing. People develop strategies that make sense in their lives and they don't often make sense in ours. We don't know this unless we go into their homes and figure out what's going on. Here's Health Information Central in a house, a very beautiful desk with a lot of clutter in it. And somehow or other, this person's better able to manage a whole lot better than this person who's got information everywhere and no way to find the information. Here's an example of a household where the living room has become the health center and information is brought together in a space. Now, as you're looking at this and as you're developing your op academic objectivity or perhaps your cleanliness streak, remember these people function in these homes and these work for them. So it's our job to make our health information engagement work in their homes, not their job to clean up the house because we're there. 
Um, this is about the best medication cupboard I've ever seen. It actually is in the kitchen, um, right next to the stove, so it's probably not good for medication that are heat sensitive, uh, but it is close to the computer. So this is a household where people were, were thinking, we have an information central in our house. When um, the early movement of patient-centered records was coming about, people thought that there would be a, a information center in a house for health, uh, for health and health care. Actually, we have found that is so not true. People live all over their house and their health data is all over their house. And sometimes it's in very complicated places. Um, here is a picture of a household of a woman who's in her mid 60s, who's a very unstable diabetic, who's actually doing pretty well with managing her diabetes. Um, if you look across the top of this box here, you see her uh, record book, the black book in the front, you see her testing strips and a disposal uh, container for her sharps, but you also see cereal and shampoo and uh, ho-hos back there and wrapping paper. So everything is sitting there on top of this filthy and I mean filthy pet porter. Do you all know what a pet porter is? So inside the pet porter are two Rottweilers. Two Rottweilers. Now, this brings health data security into a whole new meaning. But what it also does is it makes us realize if we're going to bring technology into this house, where are we going to put it? How is it going to fit? So when we try to think about the living environments for people, we try to think about these houses. We have done, we have about 20 years of experience in my research team to bring technology into people's homes. But if you look around these pictures, you'll see the upper right hand corner. This is a wonderful place, the coffee table in the living room, terrible ergonomics. And by the way, there is a cord running between the coffee table and the sofa. So we have now introduced a hazard as opposed to reduced hazards in the home. The patient in the lower right hand corner is using something called a web TV, an old device that thank God disappeared, but it was designed to let you view uh, video, uh, uh, web pages on your television set. Um, the screen, the resolution is bad. He's sitting in front of a window. The glare is bad. He's going to have a headache very quickly, even if he's not in VR. But more importantly, this is a public device. And if you're trying to find out private information about yourself, self-management, when can I start having sex after cardiac surgery, or do I really feel like I hate my child right now? That is hard to do in a public place. when you're. So we have to think about where is a person sitting when we're trying to deliver health information into their home. Um, the lower left hand corner of the person, this is the dining room table. So the device is so big, it's common to the entire dining room table. And underneath the table, there's oxygen tanks. So this person actually sort of keeps things together and not. And then in the upper left hand corner, I love the flowers there. That just made me feel like this person was making their health center home. When we try to bring information into people's home and we try to use technology to do this, to help them better self-manage, we need to think very systematically. So I'm going to present to you what we call the SEEPS work system model. Uh, SEEPS is a systems engineering for patient safety, systems engineering initiative for patient safety. It's an initiative that Pascal Carrion from Wisconsin developed. But you'll see the classic Don and Beattie in structure process outcome along the top. Work system leads to the ability to do processes, leads to certain outcomes. Now move this into a healthcare environment and you see the work system has five elements people in the center trying to carry out a certain task, lower left-hand corner, using certain technologies, upper right-hand corner, within a, or a certain organizational structure that might have guidance or guidelines or practices, um, and in a given physical environment. So this model, we actually thought was really very nice and could help us as we start to think about, first of all, the home as the environment for care, and the tasks being cognitive tasks, planning, sorting, and selecting and the person being a patient, not a clinician. And that means bringing in information to someone who isn't paid to deal with the information, maybe lacks the education and the schooling for that information. We have an opportunity to think about the home in new ways. And yet, as I was saying in the beginning of my talk, it's intrusive to go into people's homes. When I say we were in a thousand homes, that took us 15 years to do. I'm grateful for all those people who let us come in, but really, do you want a nurse coming in and seeing how many bags of chips you have in your kitchen? It exposes the sense of privacy. And so we have to find different ways to study and understand the person's environment. So for that purpose, we decided we would try to use virtual reality. Our plan was in Wisconsin, to build a cave, which you see in the upper left-hand corner, you see people standing in the cave, 
to recreate household environments using visualization tools. In the lower left-hand space, you see the exact same cave, the exact same space, but now projected in there is an actual household environment. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a, a head-mounted device. This is a somewhat older device than we use right now, but I, they actually haven't changed all that much in five years. And then on the screen, you see an individual sitting in front of a screen. Those two ovals are actually reflecting the two different eye projections. This is a little bit why you get sick, by the way. There's two different projections on your eyes. The better we can align that, the better off we'll be. We can talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to ask you to look at the, this household with the lady standing in it for a minute. What do you notice about that? It's too clean. We call this the Ikea house. This, look, it's very real. It looks absolutely real, but we all know it's not real. Um, there's a concept in virtual reality called the uncanny valley. If you make the images look too real, people reject them. They actually can be frightened by them, avatars, for example. But we also know if it doesn't look real enough, people reject it. So building proper environments is, is a challenge. I'm gonna show you a video in a few minutes about how we built some environments. But just to go back to explain why we think VR can help. Virtual reality provides an encounter that is a physical engagement where the participant is giving the sensory experience of being immersed in an environment different from where one is physically present. Increasingly in healthcare, VR is being used for both investigative and interventional uses for many reasons, but one is a relatively low cost of recreating these elaborate environments and the control that researchers have. So we are examining things like how much clutter distracts people from self-management versus how much clutter is necessary for people to feel like they're at home. I spent, as I said, five years in Wisconsin working on this, so I'm going to show you a brief video of the work that we did there, and then we'll talk about what I'm doing in, in D.C. A lot of people, when they think of cave, they think of a dark, secluded place. Here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, when we think of cave, we think of a tool that can bring light and knowledge into the world. The cave stands for Cave Automatic Virtual Environment. This is very powerful for us as scientists, engineers, and people just trying to study the world in general. Our team is studying the way in which households help or interfere with people's ability to take care of themselves. A cave allows multiple people to be in the same virtual environment at the same time. So we can get insights from engineers, from nurses, from rehabilitation specialists to rehearse and improve that person's ability to make the transition into the home. It really gives us a tool to understand human behavior and how we can understand the world and see it from a different perspective. Those last two shots were visualizations of the solar system and cells, but what you saw in the middle were households, and they should have looked a little more realistic to you because what our team did was took a LIDAR scanner, a laser type scanner into households and recreated a full 360 full color replica of the house that you could actually walk through. This allowed us to better understand, create more realistic households. And then we used that for a series of experiments to understand where people stored health data, what they did within different rooms, how the, re, the, the visual cueing of a room interfered with or supported someone's attempt to go after health activities. So VR in healthcare is growing. You see a lot of use of VR for therapeutics right now. Pain management is a very common um, target for virtual reality experiences. And these are, this is often because virtual reality experience provides a distraction intervention for the individual. There's some evidence from fMRI that, that virtual reality simulations can also make one feel happy, pleasant, uh, alter the sense of, of, of well-being in a way that actually enables an individual to be more receptive to, to um, other types of non-chemical non or pharmacological current strategies for pain management, such as music. Um, there's, a, there's interest in phobia extraction, mostly um, uh, exposure extra, uh, extinction rather. Um, I, I'm not wild about this one, to be quite honest. I, I have some concerns about the ethics of this. Uh, the implosion therapy that's possible through virtual reality is actually quite frightening to many people, and yet the psychologists that work with it have found it to be useful. 
Um, certainly in stroke rehabilitation, virtual reality has been very helpful. Um, one of the strategies has been having an individual uh, create the um, amount of muscle tension necessary to move an object and then get visual feedback that the object is moving without ever stressing their muscle. So whether it's trying to remove move your shoulder after you've had surgery or trying to build up muscle strength, virtual reality provides you a chance to develop muscle strength without straining or risking muscle integrity. Um, there's a lot of work on for surgical planning and treatment planning using haptics, that is tactile feedback. And one of the, the, the interesting things that has happened, so in, you can't touch anything in VR. These are all images, and if you try to touch them, your hand goes right through. But you can build physics, you can build resistance into the objects. So if you try to touch something, you're, you, you actually get a, a sense of a feedback that tells you you can't move through here. What really is happening is a little trick of your brain though, that instead, when I touch this top of the computer, my hand is stopped and it can't move. But if I was touching a virtual computer, simply having a slight vibration at the point at which my hand intersected where the edge of the computer was, is enough to make an individual pull back. So you can recreate some haptics. In terms of, of um, the other uses of, of virtual reality, we see a lot of interest in training and rehearsal. The Department of Defense is quite interested in VR as a training device. And um, our group is pre it's particularly interested in VR for home care. Uh, we are interested in VR to, to, as a mechanism, both as a tool to study practices for home care, as well as perhaps an eventual intervention where people would rehearse in one space and then move to another space for their home care management. Um, this is part of our team here. Uh, Jim uh, Holdenack, the second uh, member, is our senior scientist. Donnie Bliss is our artist. Um, India uh, uh, Little is our, one of our post -back students, and John Astuni is our engineer. Um, in the video you saw, by the way, Kevin Ponto, who was speaking first, is a computer scientist and artist. Because what virtual reality requires that we do is combine technology and aesthetics a lot. So in our, home, in our team at, Wisconsin, in, uh, at DC, we've, kind of, we've got the same set of skills. Our long-range goal is to improve self-management. We're specifically planning to devise interactive, that is, things that people engage with, virtual reality simulation. So we want to go beyond just walking through and visualizing, which is very cool, but doesn't necessarily teach people new behaviors. Um, visual, interactive simulations that present patients with familiar self-management tasks in realistic environments, enabling patients to both rehearse the problem-solving behaviors and that that's a focuses on transfer learning or allowing scientists to isolate the human response. And we have our work right now is actually focusing more on, on the second one, I, I, isolating human response, the response to cognitive fatigue, to clutter, to some uh, behaviors. Where we are right now is we're creating the engagement with very with realistic environments and we're working to, to, to accelerate that um, and devising measurement strategies. Virtual reality is a very, very primitive research tool. And so some of the, the, the techniques that we use to measure performance or behaviors or attitudes in what we call real reality don't actually transfer as well. So, we, so self-reported questionnaires, for example, don't, question, don't transfer as well. We can use things such as gait, gesture, posture, speed of, of um, acceleration are as indicators of human response. And so we are studying those in more depth right now. So we've got our work system model, and that's guiding what we're doing in, in our environments here. Um, now we have the patient, the cognitive activities in the home. That is the focus. Eventually, we hope to be able to look downstream at improving both processes and outcome, what we're very early in the process. Um, like any activity for the federal government, creating my laboratory took a lot more time than I had expected. I joined the NIH in August of 16, and our lab opened last August. So it was a little bit of a long time getting it, but it was worth waiting for. So what are we working on right now? We're working on get, making sure that we have the tools available and we're familiar with how to use these tools to make sure that we're able to create an environment that individuals can engage with and interact with. So we use, we're using the Hive, which is a new, next generation VR device. And we're also using a number of different tools for interaction. On the right hand side, you see basically the space of our lab. It doesn't look like anything because what people do when they're in this area is they wear the head mounted device. They use right now this set of controllers, but we also have haptic gloves to move around in the space. 
So this is what one looks like in virtual reality. It's not all that interesting. They actually sent me four videos to show you of this person walking around, but really what you want to see what she's actually seeing. We're going to see that in a few minutes. Um, but, it, but, it, but, it is, but what I want to show you here is as an investigator, what I have to be thinking about is safety, rep, re, reproducibility, rigor. So we have the, the grid on the top allows us to have emitters, so we're able to very precisely measure where a person is. This floor below has, uh, is, is, um, is foam core, so it's, it's, it's safe for an individual. No one is ever in our lab alone. So all those pictures of a person by themselves, you, we never have somebody alone because you need a spotter nearby because people can get disoriented. You'll notice there's no, um, there's no cables on this individual. That is, we, the, the, the virtual reality devices, the head mount devices have improved so much that now there are, there, you can have cable-free devices. This is a big advantage. Um, our space is 12 by 12. When you get to the edge of the green space, there's a six inch sort of angled black space so that you have a cue if you're moving off of the space. So again, we build the laboratory for safety for the individuals as they're, as they're moving through this space. So the problems that motivate our work. Um, we are motivated by the self-management in the home, but we, we're working with a nurse expert, Denise Goldsmith, who is helping us um, identify and isolate which problems are of greatest concern to, to home care nurses. And they identified management of the patient with chronic heart, congestive heart failure. Um, this is a really good problem because it's a place where symptom management actually makes a difference. You actually, if you, for the most part, people with congestive heart failure, if they self-manage well, they actually can make sure that they don't get, they, get, they, they can avoid hospitalization and they can maintain good patent airways. Um, and also from, for uh, patients with um, uh, congestive heart failure, the care that they get in the home is way more important than the care they get in the clinical facility until they're actually in a crisis. Then they, of course, need to be in a clinical facility. So the activities that, the nurse, that our nurse panelists told us were important were helping people follow a sodium-restricted diet, manage co a complex medication regime, and monitor health state. And we're focusing on the first two of these, managing, following a sodium-restricted diet and managing complex medication regime. Now, we're, we're focusing on pieces that will put together the puzzle of how to better help people manage with these. But our, our goal has been to create environments to do this. So if you're going to be managing a sodium-restricted diet, one of the things that the, the clinical nurses told us is a key problem is purchasing food. So we created a virtual grocery. It doesn't look like it's much liquor at the groceries you see. But when you're testing out in virtual reality, some of the things you need to be able to test out is the space for locomotion, visual cueing, the space for interaction. So these primitives actually worked very well with us. Um, you'll notice on the right-hand side, there's, there's some all white text. Because we're interested in how do people pick foods that are relevant for a sodium-restricted diet, you'll see in a few minutes that we actually have sodium levels on this food. Um, this is a, a wand array that you see here in, in the front. Um, it's the way, one way to interact with an object. We've now progressed, and I'll show you in a few minutes how we're interacting with eye gaze. And we know that the challenge in shopping for someone who is on a sodium-restricted diet is understanding or comparing foods that have more than one level of sodium. So we're, we start our first primitive, we start off with just simply reporting sodium. And now, any of you who've worked with uh, the USDA or know anything about, about training patients to select foods in a grocery store know that we have to help them read the entire food label, not just this sim single. So we're working towards that, but this was our start off here. We also, we also are testing feedback tools. For example, giving people a summary at the end of the grocery shopping experience, how much sodium they've had, because I'm telling you right now, at the end of going to Kroger's, you can get a list of how much money you've saved. And it's possible that we could capitalize on that technology to actually give people feedback on the sodium content of their food basket. So we, the VR is not only helping us think about how patients behave, but giving us cues to how we might make real world situations. Now, I hope you'll find this one looks a little more realistic. This is our second pass at the grocery store, has a, a possibility of looking more real, realistic in the fact that we have multiple objects that look like food objects. I'm going to show you a brief video of how, what an individual would see walking through this, if I can get this to. So there's an individual moving through. The teleporting is a way to jump through spaces, and now they're looking at a single box on the right-hand side. You see that they're, they're blue and it's lighting up. The individual is able to pick that up 
and look at the back and hovering over the top of it, we have some specific sodium information. This has allowed us to test out several things that have been helpful in understanding how people might engage with our environment. What kind of objects need to be in place? How large do they need to be? How do we display text in VR, which is, it presents challenges because the resolution isn't as good as the interaction on your, your screen, it's, uh, it, in the screen in front of you. We've also tried to deal with issues such as clutter and um, fami <clears throat> excuse me, familiarity of the objects. And going through this process, as I'll run through one more time with you again, is enhanced by some conventions that we know about grocery stores, like cereals are all kept in one place and produce is kept in a different place than the actual uh, dry goods food. So recreating virtual environments requires replicating what's relevant from the environment in the new space so that an individual doesn't see it as too uh, unusual or too strange. Um, here we have uh, an, a, the confirmation if someone has selected an, an object. Um, our team is actually debating about whether we should be providing nutrition information with um, the, the, as it's actually reflected on the nutrition label, which has varying size of servings. So the person who is making the choice of the food has to actually mentally compute which of those has the lowest sodium per unit as opposed to the lowest amount of sodium. Our, our clinical team frankly tells us this is too complicated of a task for people to test and we may not need to get this complicated. We're, 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 we're continue to work with getting clinical advice. Um, we've learned that it's actually quite difficult to, to actually purchase images of uh, foodstuffs that look real. So you see the Frosted Flakes and Lucky Charms, we have a, a, a patent infringement problem going on. They don't want us to use their devices in our, our study. General Foods is actually, um, has now moved to say we can use it as long as it's just for research. But Campbell's, you see, we have Swift instead of Campbell's because we can't use the Campbell's label. They don't want it in our lab. So creating realistic environments requires bringing in a whole set of IP intellectual property conversations. We eventually hope to be getting to a, a grocery store that looks like a grocery store, and feels like a grocery store, and gives an individual the opportunity to actually discern from a typical label that they would routinely see the ability to discern and carry out the task of figuring out what should they make their market basket. Um, our, we've now, we've, this is a hot off the press latest uh, grocery store that we've developed. We have been working with a commercial company to actually get uh, vent assets that, look, that are able to have a better look and feel while we go forward with creating um, shelf life and shelf products that are similar to the to what we would expect to see. Now, this is as far as we've gotten with developing a, a, a virtual reality simulation for space in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a grocery store that would give an individual experience with the task of selecting. We, we recognize there are many other aspects of making this task realistic. So our, we have three next steps coming up. First is we're gonna be bringing our nurse experts into the space to get their feedback about the realism and the likelihood of the space. And then we're gonna bring a group of patient responders in to help us understand, does this look like what you would expect? So the building up of this research tool to make it research strong actually is gonna take us another year to two years to do. We've first experimented with home environments. Now we're experimenting with grocery environments. Now I'm going to take you back into a home environment to, de to deal with the task, uh, a very different task the patients face at home, rehearsing medication management. Um, yes, that is a disembodied hand that you see sitting over the, uh, the sheen here. So we're, this is, an, remember we're talking about early primitives here, all right? So what we, what we know is that patients don't like interacting with small devices with the wand. So we have to find something that's easier a hand is, a, 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 the, the replication of a hand is actually easier. What we learned though, when it was just a hand that looked like a hand, oh, that wasn't good at all. The glove is actually better, more acceptable to patients. But here we have a typical situation. Patient has six medications. They need to sort them in the medication box. We've explored a variety of different kinds of medication boxes and we've explored a variety of tasks. So an individual sitting in the kitchen is given the challenge or the task of trying to sort the medications into the proper bins. The challenge here is that patients combine their medications into one bottle, they move them around, they don't always know them by name, and it's very difficult to actually get the 
prescribed regime for medications for patients. So one of the things we're finding is to be able to use this kind of a tool to help individual patients, even if we can make the environment realistic. And here we, you see a person sorting their medication in the kitchen. This is a, a typical place where people sort their medications for the week. Still requires us that we help think through what are the behaviors that we're trying to mimic. And we had originally thought we could simply go to pick, take medication bottles, blast the medication label, and have the person do a sorting task. But because people actually repackage their own medications, we're, still, we're, we're sort of stumped and we're working through this. Let me close my remarks and go on to a conversation with you about what some of the issues are that we're facing, why we're doing this, and what are the challenges that we have coming up. So why are we going through all this virtual reality activity? Well, first and foremost, I have to tell you, nurses must be at the table of innovation. We have to be out there figuring out how emerging technologies are gonna work for patients. The specific activities that I'm doing make sense in terms of their valuable and important pro problems. But the more important part of this is to say to the communities that we work with, we have to think about how to use these emerging technologies because remember, if we wanna reach into the care between the care, the spaces where people live, we're gonna to have to make use of lots of technologies. And we've gotta accelerate our, our thinking about how they can be used and useful. Virtual and valid environments allow both familiarity and control. That is the investigator is able to create something that looks like an individual's home and also gives us control over how, how typical or how, how reproducible the scene is. Now we've been experimenting with smartphones, with taking pictures of someone's home, taking a video, as many of you have taken videos of, uh, with your smartphone, and then converting that video into a 3D representation of your home. So we can use the VR space to represent your home. We've actually, in some corollary activities, been working with Epic and Cerner to identify how if we had 3D replications of a patient's home and use that for patient training, could we actually store that in the patient's record so that an, other care providers would know what that patient has learned about? And we would know what kind of houses are in the home, what kind of space is available, what kind of modifications need to be made. So the, the work that we're doing is, is both trying to make a perfect lab, but also trying to influence the practice of care. Right now, what we think we're gonna be able to do is first develop mechanistic understanding. We're trying to better understand common patterns and problems in self-management. We know very little, for example, about how confused do people really get with sorting their medications. And it would be useful to be able to make some measures of that so we would be able to know that. So we think we're gonna be able to get some mechanistic understanding. We hope to be able to devise new interventions and downstream, and I truly believe this is downstream, we will be able to take experiences in the virtual world and use them as training for the future life of that individual patient. Imagine if every home care nurse had a head mounted device to help a patient get trained to go through their home care processes. We might be able to accelerate the process of training, but that's really downstream. It's not something that's going to happen in the next week, unfortunately. Um, what are the key challenges and why isn't it happening now? Well, the quality, characterizing the quality of virtual environments is in its infancy. You know, you've, you saw the difference between the IKEA house and the actual visualizations and trying to get those aligned and say, what's really the most important stimuli we just are still working on. Our measurement strategies are not well understood. Um, it's bar time. I, I, <laughs> uh, for those of you who are just listening online, the lights just went up, but they're back on. Um, the environments still have to be purpose-built. There is no storehouse to go to, but I do envision a time in the future where it will become as common in a patient's history to have a recreation of your home as it is to have your, your family's history of thyroid disease. So knowing where you live will become an important part of your patient history. We have to deal with the uncanny valley. Things that are too real are gonna scare people. Things that are not real enough are gonna be dismissed by individuals. So we have to work with that. We, we, we talked in the very beginning of my talk today, engaging with virtual environments is awkward and unfamiliar. It's still not natural to do this, but I gotta tell you, smartphones were not natural 10 years ago and now everybody except my mother can use them and my mother's coming along. Um, we, have, we know very little about how perception and cognition are actually engaged. We have some ideas and what VR is gonna let us do is to isolate 
the distraction factor versus the engagement factor of visual stimuli. And I'm very excited about that. And we do know that the sensory and cognitive deficits in the target populations could interfere with the intervention fidelity. That doesn't mean we don't do this. It means we have to modify our interventions to be able to make sure we reach that, part, that, that problem. Despite these problems, we are persisting. We are building the tools to be able to do this. So I will close with some of our current work and uh, some cool things and some weird things. So we're interested in can directive walking give us cues to cognitive load? Here's an image of someone walking through our grocery store primitive. And what we want to understand is does the pattern of walking through the grocery store indicate something about the person's confusion or their ability to engage with, with self-management, can we infer that deliberate shopping actually gives us promise for that person's ability to self-manage or does it give us an indicator that, that they really are not good decision makers and they go after certain devices? So figuring out this path, especially what we call the ellipsis and the returns, people starting and stopping in different areas, we're trying to measure through something called fractile dimension. Fractile dimension is the deviation from a straight line. So here's India back in our lab and she's walking around and she's taken that circuitous path you see in the blue, which is actually tracked specifically in the red because she's wearing two different tractors. One is a head tracker and one is a waist tracker. And you see the, the black line is the straight line. That's the shortest distance between the two points. So the fractile dimension uh, on here is 1.23 and 1.23 with this, the, the digits far, far into the six significant digits. But what it's telling us is that by tracking an individual, we're able to know the deviation from the straight line. We're able to compute this, a low fractile dimension that is a low amount of wandering is a score towards one, a high amount of wandering is a score towards two. So this is a one strategy we're going to be able to use to actually measure how much disorientation or disorientation goes on in VR. We're actually looking at new ways to lift and move objects around this. I spoke to you earlier about using um, EMG signals and muscle tension to lift and move objects around. We think this will have some promise not only for rehabilitation, but actually for our selection. Uh, we have a small team, mostly these are students that like to do this, are looking at the presence of avatars. Now I have to, avatars scare me. Uh, in the right hand corner, you see two, you see a, a live person and an avatar. Can you tell which is which? I find it a little unnerving because it actually took me a while to figure out that the person on the right is the avatar. But when we put, I'm sorry, the person on the left is the avatar, the person on the right is the real person. Sorry, I said it backwards, I did it again. Um, the person on the left, I mean, the, the figure on the left is the avatar, the figure on the right is the real person. Um, we learned that avatars, people believe avatars as long as they blink. If avatars don't blink, nobody believes them. But if it starts blinking, they can look as, as different from the person as you, would, you, you can imagine, but they'll still be believed because they blink. But when we're trying to test out activities such as shopping or medication sorting in the home, we know there's often other people around. So it doesn't make sense to, to, to test it out without other characters in the scene. So we're looking at avatars. Another group that we're working with is trying to create a statistical model of clutter. So on the top row, you see three different pictures of households. On the bottom row, you three, see three different computer generated sets of clutter. One has lots of color and objects. The second has, uh, is more monochromatic, but has a number of different objects. And the third number C in the far right has a number of objects that are all the same, which appears to be more cluttered and how do we develop that? We don't have good ways of measuring this, but we're beginning to do this, beginning to look into this with the hope that in the future, our environments will be easier to, to create. There's lots of questions we can ask in the future. One of the ones in particular is, now that we know about hovering food nutrition information over the item, if we could do that in the real world through Google Glass or some sort of augmented reality projection, would people make better choices in the moment? Would you be more likely to pick up the cottage cheese than the ice cream when you open the refrigerator? Or would you know that there really is a lot of sodium in that soup and you might not take it? So we wanna find, instead of having people learn about sodium restriction diets in the clinic and maybe make food choices while in the, in the, clinic, in the, the food store, at the moment that they're selecting a food, is that the best point for intervention? We have lots of questions to answer, lots of areas to be exploring, and I'm really very excited with the team we've put together to do this. We also, it's a bit of advertising, have a position open. We have a postdoctoral position open right now for a nurse 
who has interest and expertise in the areas of human cognition, of patient education, of patient response, chronic care disease, because we need to bring more clinical information into our, uh, our activities. Our position is gonna be open for, I mean, the, the position posting is up for about another three weeks. If you know of people who are looking for postdocs, have them give me a call. I thank you for your attention. Here's our team again. You can reach us at the avb at ninr.nih.gov. And I do have my day job as the director of the National Library of Medicine. I post a blog every Tuesday afternoon, and in two weeks there will be a blog about this content that I just presented but uh, you can always reach me by email. Thanks for your time and let's have a little bit of conversation.